Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where his disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand, and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, poor Thomas. You know, I have a soft spot for Thomas. Thomas is my middle name. It's the name we gave to our eldest son. 
and so I want to stick up for him here. He gets a bit of an unfair rap. In fact, we've created an entire category of people called Doubting Thomases, which is deeply unfair. We don't talk about denying Peters or runaway naked Marks. But Thomas gets tagged with his moment of disbelief, of doubt, rather than, perhaps, his moment of confessing Jesus as God. He is, in fact, the first to do so directly. Not the Messiah, not Son of God, which can be expressions simply meaning one who is close to God. But no, my Lord and my God, says Thomas when Jesus reveals himself. But no, not remembered for that, he's remembered for his doubt. Now, the nature of this doubt is easy to misunderstand. C.S. Lewis writes that this doubt isn't doubt in the existence of God, doubt in the existence of Jesus. Obviously, Thomas knows that. It is actually a more serious and a more personal doubt. You see, when we talk about belief, we are not talking about intellectual assent, saying, I believe that there is a God. That is one step, and it is an important step, as we'll see later. But there is more to belief for any person of faith, but specifically for Christians. The belief that Jesus is talking about, the belief that Christians mean when we speak of our belief in Jesus, is not the intellectual assent that he existed. Most people, believers, non-believers, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, agree that Jesus existed. Most also agree that he was a great teacher, that he spoke great wisdom, God's wisdom. That sort of belief is assumed. The belief that we talk about when we speak of belief in Jesus is not intellectual assent, but trust. Giving our hearts to, giving our hopes to, placing our all in. It is, at its foundation, trust. And Thomas has some trust issues. That's evident if you look at the proofs he asks for. He doesn't ask to see Jesus walking and talking. He asks to see the wounds. I want to see that the pain, the suffering, and the death which have broken my heart, I want to see that those are real. I want to see evidence that the God to whom I wish to give my life has given his life for me. He doesn't have that innate trust. The reason this is potentially worse, but still predicated on the belief of intellectual assent, can be seen if you apply it to any relationship. Think of your close friends, your spouse, your children. Now, first of all, if you did not believe that your spouse existed, then nothing else is possible. So yes, intellectual assent is required as a foundational element of a relationship of trust. But what is most important is that trusting love to give one's heart to. That is what is at the root of any relationship, and this is the thing. Belief in God, and specifically belief in Jesus, is not an act of mind or imagination. It is an act of heart and will to give oneself over to. It is a relationship with a person, with Jesus. Jesus the one who was born for you. Jesus, the one who healed you. Jesus, the one who feeds and teaches you. Jesus, the one who guides you. Jesus, the one who died for you. And Jesus, the one who rose again for you. This intimacy is expressed in our sacramental life. When we are baptized, we are baptized into the body of Christ. We are made one with him. When we are confirmed, we are sealed in the Spirit of God. When we receive communion, we take Christ's own body and blood into our body and blood, that we might, on, on a cellular level, grow to be more like him. When we sin, we are forgiven by him. When we are sick, we are anointed by him. When we join together in marriage, that love is united in him. Even when we are called through ordination to lead his people, it is done in him. All of Christian life is encircled with this relationship, this friendship, this dance between us and God, between the self and Christ. Now, that can sound very individualistic. It's me and God. But 
that relationship is also played out in the relationship of love among the community. That lateral communion that goes not simply between us and God, but between us and our neighbor. Remember Jesus speaking the two great commandments, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It is not simply a two-way street, me to God, God to me. It is an intersection where my relationship with the divine intersects my relationship with the community. And in that intersection, the fullness of relationship with Christ is known. And so when we relate to one another, we are to do so as if that other is Christ. And so this is the relationship in which Thomas has failed. He did not trust. So what is Jesus' reaction? Does he come and yell at him? Does he come and holler at him? Chew him out? Embarrass him in front of the other disciples? No. He comes to him where he is. Look at my hands. Look at my side. Don't doubt. Believe. And he acknowledges, yes, you have come to belief, and that is good, but you've come there because you've seen. Blessed are those who don't see and yet believe, who, even when life is painful, even when the road is hard, even when the day is bleak and the night long and dark, still and all have trust still and all put their faith and their love and their hope in me. May you who have not seen nevertheless believe and there find your trust, your hope, and your life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.